think about your legacy. Because when I got up to speak at his funeral, I was the last speaker, and I looked at a crowd of a thousand people. I thought, I don't even know half of these people. They're from his work, they're from community, they're from church, they're family members, they're friends he's had since he was a kid riding motorcycles and racing. Like, it was just incredible to see the support. Not just because it was a travesty that he died halfway through our traditional life expectancy, but because he was a man of purpose and he left his legacy. What's your purpose? All right, we know this. Time is valuable. Don't waste it. Make time for the things that are most important. And I've got several things I want to teach you, but really, I went back to school, as I was mentioning earlier, I tried to figure out, how do I manage stress? How do I deal with these health issues that I'm, I know I'm maybe prone to, which is stress? <laughs> and and we, my wife and I changed our, our lifestyles. We changed our eating habits. We changed a lot about how we school our children. That's why I can take my kids with me to conferences and families. We homeschool, and that's, this is them learning. They're learning about real life experiences, learning from you. Um, so it's a great way to do it, but that's what we chose to do. We've changed a lot about what we do to try to make things better, try to leave a legacy but to achieve our goals. But there's one thing I've learned from everything that, that I've taken away from my master's degree in psychology, PhD, is that time is the most important factor. It's the most important factor in achieving your goals and leaving your legacy. What are you doing with it? All right, Travis, let's get to the, let's get to the meat here. Um, so here is the make time productivity system that I've come up with. This isn't just something I come up with on a whim. I've tested this for the last 12 years. Pre and post data with couples all throughout the country. I presented at conferences and I brought this specifically to the financial planning world because I know this industry. I know what you're going through. I know what your firms look like, what the expectations are, the stresses that are here. And I want to be able to help an industry that is prone to some of these issues that I know, I know for a fact, are causing you sleepless nights. So we're going to get to each of these steps. Values is number one. As Eighth was introducing yesterday, we're going to focus on this. This is the core. I was glad that Eddie brought this up in his leadership pipeline. Um, values are critical. Goals, priorities, we'll get to productivity, which everybody thinks is time management, right? But it's productivity. And fifth is accountability, which is mentioned. I'm gonna have a, that's my secret sauce. It's a little twist at the very end, so stay tuned. So number one, what are values? What are values? Anybody have a great definition of this? It didn't already get my slides and looking ahead. Cheaters, I know you're out there. Anybody? Anybody want to have a good definition? Come on. Keep that nine second rule. Usually it's like 30 seconds to let people think about it. They start to realize, okay, no one else is going to say anything, so I'm going to raise my hand. Who are you? I know you're out there. I got you back there. Go ahead. Uh, what is important What's important to you? Great. Yes. A moral standard? Moral standards. Obviously, that's a lot of times where values come from, right? Our society helps create those standards, our values, which come from a lot of different Areas. This is not sociology class, but it is part of it. Um, we'll get there. So I wanted to, I updated my slides last night and realized, Travis, Texas A&M, they have values. <laughs> they don't just have goals and mission statement. They have values. That's where Covey got all this from. There's nothing new in what Covey presented. His seven habits of highly effective people are incredibly useful. We, sh we use them all the time. Um, but really, it's all about values. Where do these values come from? I love this. Loyalty, respect, integrity, service, excellent leadership. Texas Aggies, you guys have values. As you dig into those values and you really understand them, you will stand out among your peers. When you go for jobs, when you are starting out at whatever firm, you stick to those values. These are phenomenal. You give a, you give a talk all about the, each individual values. But values are principles that you believe to be true that give you direction. And by the way, Financial Planning 101, the very first page, talks about values. You understand your clients' values, they will love you. you oh man, they get me. 
They just get me. Of course they get you. They understand what your values are, and they're going to try to help you reach your goals. Values is where it starts. Because you believe that they're true and it'll guide your life, but they're also discovered through self-reflection. Through deep understanding, we don't have an hour to sit here and talk about this. I'm going to give you a quick exercise you can take home with you, some homework. But they will give you the internal motivation you need. You don't need Tony Robbins every day. No offense, Tony. Love you. Um, but if um, I realized this a long time ago, that external motivator, that, you know, that music, that Rocky, you know, Eye of the Tiger, I used to play that coming into work every day. I'm like, yeah. I mean, it lasts for like 30 seconds, and then you're done, right? It's nice, and it might stay in your head. But that external motivation only lasts as long as you remember the conference, as long as you remember the music, as long as you remember that slogan. And it can work. But internal motivation is way more motivating. And you can stay focused through that internal motivation. So Michael, as we talked about his story, he just said people notice at work once he started just uncovering his values, just discovering what these were. And he started getting this clarity, got him out of this fog that he was in. He said he had to skip in his step. People noticed like, hey, he loved being there at work. He was there early. He got out of there earlier. He got home to his wife, who is also a financial advisor. They're also in the same business. And uh, they, they are able to spend more time together. He's more productive, happier, great guy. So how, what do we do? What's our takeaway? Well, part of the packet that I was mentioning to you guys, there's a worksheet in here. It's called the mini obituary exercise. I've had thousands of people do this. Covey has a somewhat similar version. But after having this experience with my father, where I was the one who had to write down everything, and nobody in my family wanted to do it, man, I spent hours agonizing over every word and wondering, like, how do I make this sound good? This is my dad. Like, he was such a good dude. Like, how do I express this? And I had an experience so moving to my core that I realized, hey, I need to do this. I need to write my own obituary. No, not Travis fell off a cliff and fell to his bloody death. Like, no, I don't, don't write about that. Like, it doesn't matter the details of how you pass away. But we're all going to do it. Like, there's two things in life that are secure, right? Taxes and death. And sometimes you get both at the same time um, if you don't plan well. So the, that's a financial planning joke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there really is 10 areas of life that we boil down to. In each of these 10 areas, the way you do this mini obituary worksheet, this exercise, is to think about what you would have people say about you in each area at the end of your life what you would hope they would say about you. Maybe not right now, but what you'd hope they'd say about you at the end of your life. Or if you want to be religious about this, what you'd hope God or your family would say about you or hope that you would become. Okay? Truly, these different areas are what makes up our life. And then I have at the very top, this is kind of the long form. You write it out. Then you look for the characteristics, not the check marks, not the I accomplished this, I accomplished that. Maybe some people put heed to that, but you walk through a cemetery. You see accomplishments on headstones? Nobody cares, quite honestly. Most people that have values don't really care about that. They want to be known as father, husband, son, brother. They care about those relationships. So then you write these down, these characteristics, those things that describe you in a list form. Those are your values. Okay? You can flush this out, take a lot of time doing it, but once you can accomplish and figure out what those values are, then you're on the right track. Step two, now you know what your values are, now set goals. You see, as financial advisors, here's what we do. Mr. and Mrs. Client, in 30 years from now, when you're old and gray, tell me about what you're going to be doing in your retirement. And you've got the husband, oh, well, we'll be having vacations on the yachts. And the wife is like, what? What are you talking about? We're going to be doing this, right? Never happened to you in your office. And all of a sudden, they realize these guys have never talked about their goals and values together. Maybe they don't even know each other's values. Maybe they've never even talked about this. So you start feeling like you're a marriage therapist. 
and, and you start trying to control, wait, wait, wait <laughs> what do you do now? Because you're not trained in relationships. Zero courses on the CFP are directly related to married couples and their relationship issues. That's why they had me speak last week at FPA all about that topic. But the reality is most of us, we don't think this way. We don't think, oh, in 30 years, this is what I'm going to be doing. It's so esoteric and it's so far out there, we can make up anything. But if you can understand somebody's core values, that becomes their lifelong goal. They've already known what their lifelong goal is now. It's set. And all we need to do as financial planners is to look at the various aspects of their life. And if you want to be holistic, holistic isn't just financially holistic. It's looking at all the areas of life and how money touches each of these pieces. You see, we get so siphoned in, and this is a little bit of my pet peeve, so I'm on, a, I'm on the soapbox, I can do this. But um, we get so siphoned in and holistic as well. We need to include insurance, investments, accounting, legal. Yeah, yeah, that's holistic on a financial planning aspect. But holistic for an individual who's coming to you for financial advice cares more about the other areas of their life and how money can help them accomplish these things, right? Makes sense? Okay. So that said, now setting values-based goals to help you take action to those lifelong becoming values is a goal. How do we set them? Well, too many people do it the wrong way. They focus on all the accomplishments. This is what I want to do. Click, 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 click. Instead, their values internally, I know this from the psychological stuff that I've read and dealt with for a long time, their values internally are creating cognitive dissonance. You ever not decided right at the last minute if you should blow through that orange or stop for that red light? Yeah? That pit in your stomach, that stress that comes, that's from cognitive dissonance. When you haven't made up your mind about something and you have two competing thoughts. So if you're with a client or you yourself have values but you have accomplishments, those accomplishments might not line up with your values. And if so, that's actually creating stress. And you're not able to accomplish these things because your values aren't aligned. But once you align your values to your goals, or the other way around, goals to your values, then it makes sense. Then you honestly are moving towards things, sometimes subconsciously, not even realizing, and you accomplish goals. I've been setting goals this way for the past uh, 12 years. 90% of the goals I set every year I accomplish. 90%. I have track record. I kept them on spreadsheets. I, I keep all these records for myself. Because I know that as you accomplish this this way, it just happens. This year I had a goal to speak internationally. And I had a company that reached out to me in England, CISI, and said, hey, we had a last minute you know, issue. Would you mind flying to London and we'll, you know, we'll pay all expenses and you can travel around and do all these things? I'm like, check. Uh, sometimes things just come to you because you set it out there. You have these values that you, and, and desires that you want to do. It's based in what you want to accomplish, who you want to be. Goals should be your actions. Those are the actions. So what do those look like? Well, you guys are good with goals, right? You know about goals, but they should be smart. I teach these to my students all the time um, that goals should be smart, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timely. Well, you've already got the time. You've, you've got the lifetime. Now just... Like, by, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Just crank it down to one year, one month, one week, one day. How, that's your timely. Specific, it's got to be something that you can look at the end and say, did I accomplish this or not? What percentage of this did I accomplish? Measurable, be able to see your progress throughout. Actionable, am I taking action on this? And then realistic. Now, this is the only part realistic that I have a little bit of an issue with because some people say shoot for the stars and maybe you'll you know, you hit your target, but if you shoot for the manure pile, you're hit it all the time, right? You've heard that, it's a Brian Tracy kind of saying thing. Um, but the reality is you should make it realistic and then stretch it a little bit. Make it something that, that you can track and you can you know, ratchet up to accomplishing these things, but then stretch yourself. Because a lot of times we like to set goals, sometimes just to feel like, I did it. I accomplished this goal, uh, I'm so good. But if you don't stretch it a little bit, we're not going to get out of our comfort zone. So do you have your own values-based SMART goals? Do you have them written down? 
Do you see them every day like I do when I come into my office right above my computer? I see my goals. I say them to myself. Sometimes I say them out loud to reassure that, hey, I'm going to accomplish these things. If you don't, you're losing out on your purpose, on your legacy. You're not making time for the things that are most important. All right. Step three, priorities. I had my assistants pass out this sheet. It's also included in that packet that I'll email you. Um, <laughs> and we're going to use this here in just a second. We're going to do a little bit of a, a, of a work study here. Prioritize your values-based goals through strategic time management. This is where time management really starts to make more of a micro sense. Okay, So we're going to talk about a micro base here. This is what most of us do for time management. We're running around spinning all the plates. You ever seen this video? Guy gets up there and he spins a plate on a stick, he goes around and starts spinning another one. It's a really cool trick, right? But after a while, what happens? The first one that he was spinning starts to wobble. Right? He's got to go back and spin that plate. He's got to go back to the other one and spin that plate. The reality is we're wearing a lot of hats as entrepreneurs or self-employed people, and we have our own time. It's so great, all this flexibility. But a lot of times, because we're so flexible, we're putting and taking on hats on and off all the time so that we're spending more time switching hats. This is called multitasking, and it's a lie. Um, it's a total lie. We can't do it. Now, I can walk and talk and move my hands because those are low-level brain wave activities. But could I sit down and focus on a financial plan while carrying on a conversation with a client on something else? Absolutely not. You're going to botch either the conversation or the plan. You ever tried to send an email while someone's talking to you? You end up writing what they're saying, don't you? Like, oh, crap. You got to go back. Um, every time when you try to do two things at the same time, that are really high level issues, we, there's two things that happen. One, the quality goes down. That's a given. Quality goes down. And number two, even if you're a woman because you can multitask better than men, yeah, that's great. Um, but still, men, women, across the board, uh, we still don't do it in as little time as if we just had taken and done one task and done the next. Okay, I do this all the time if you don't believe me. I'll give you another exercise at the end if you want me to try it. But the reality is, once we got all these goals set, then most people come to you and say, Travis, now I'm overwhelmed. You were supposed to help me. <laughs> now I've got like 30 goals in all these areas of my life. Now what do I do? Okay. Well, we need to have a time management system, and we need to be able to work towards our highest priorities. So anybody, anybody ever heard the term, get my priorities in order? Right? Get your priorities in order. Well, we're going to do that right now. So pull out that worksheet. If you don't have that worksheet, raise your hand, and I can have my assistants come around. Do you guys have any more? Do you have any extra copies? Can you hand out to anybody that's got their hand raised, Jacob or Isaac? And you need to prioritize your work activities inside this. So this is not this activity, but definitely go back to your office or students. The only way that I made it through school and didn't flunk out is that I made time management a huge priority. I had a school day and a work day. School day and a work day. And at school, man, I would do all my classes. I'd try to arrange them all at the same time. And then I'd go to the library until I was done with the week's homework. And I'd come home, done. I could hang out with my family. I could be there. The next day, I would go to work, and I was all work. Didn't think about school at all. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, and that's how I would do it. I'd time block. Time blocking is incredible, and at work, you need to have that time blocking, or you will get distracted. You will go to the water cooler. You will get emails. You'll go on Facebook. You'll do Instagram. You will start wearing other hats as managers. So make time away from work a priority um, as well. So pull out this worksheet. Now, here's what I'm going to teach you. This is a very simplistic way to make priorities and to decide what is of highest priority value. You need but only one question. Okay, and Chuck knows this. He's got to see this previously in Houston. But the one question you need to ask yourself is if I could only have one. That's it.
All right, guys. I hope you're finishing up here. You should have at least your top three. Top three. But we got to move on. If you don't, um, please fill the rest of this out. If you know where you're at, that's fantastic. So here's what I've discovered through all the years of coaching this and learning this and trying to do this on my own. If we go around trying to please, you know, please with the same amount of efforts all 10 areas of our life, we're going to fail. We're going to be picking up those pieces that are broken and we're going to be reacting instead of purposeful driven with our life. But if you can focus those top three and do it very well, it actually brings up the other seven areas of our life very naturally. That's the key to this. There's other keys that we'll get to in these next few steps. This one is huge. I can't emphasize this one enough. It's called an ideal calendar. I wrote an article about it for FPA back in 2009, and it comes with that packet that I mentioned to you guys just you know, earlier. I'll give you that information again. But you need an ideal calendar that looks at the time you spend in all 10 areas of your life. And then especially at work, in order to keep you motivated and having that time block, for me, my Monday is my organization day. And I do a little bit of marketing. Tuesdays and Thursdays I coach. Wednesday is my marketing. Friday is when I write and podcast and record stuff that I need to get out and do videos. So this is an ideal calendar. And I coach and teach advisors how to keep this ideal calendar so that they uh, their own ideal calendar so that they're doing their top three priorities at work. This is just in life in general. But if you do this exercise with your work activities, I do this every day for my clients trying to help them. They're not only more productive um, at work, they're making a lot more money in a lot less time. Okay? I help them and partner with them so that they can outsource things they don't need to be doing and so they can be maximizing their time at work to emphasize that time outside. Work-life balance, again, isn't this perfect balance. It's if you can figure out how to be most productive at work in that time that you have, then time outside is golden. Time outside is what you really care about, most of you. In your top three, um, career may have been there. Career may have been you know, one of, in, the, in those top areas, but most of the time I find it has something to do with your health and relationships. Um, those are the things that most of us really care about the most. In fact, psychologists fa in, found in 2012, have you ever heard of the Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? Okay, That is like 1950s, but we're still teaching it. And they did a revised one. And they asked a psycholo or, um, evolutionary psychologists, school psychologists, they asked these people that don't have anything to do really with family to find out what is it that the American people want now. The highest priority is to be a parent. That is the highest priority. It is not self-actualization, as Maslow theorized. It is the fact that each one of us want to create a legacy, a legacy that we bring to our next generation. This work-life balance can be achieved, but you've got to have an ideal calendar. It is crucial. When Mike and I were talking the other week, he just mentioned to me, I've got my ideal calendar. It's right there. I work on it every day. And then these next tips that I'm going to give you guys have to do with that calendar. But again, if you haven't asked for it yet, um, the article has the steps, the five steps on how to create that ideal calendar is so crucial. That's the 844 number, 846-3007. It actually spells time 007, you know, James Bond. I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's a plug. <laughs> Why do I even do that? That's crazy. Step four. Productivity. Now, I've got to be really productive with my time as I spent all this time on values, which was so important. So I've got about 10 minutes left to teach you these last couple of topics. Productivity. Well, we can spend hours on this, and I do. Once you have your time neatly into this ideal calendar and you're living your values, you're moving forward in your business and in personal life, then you're able to, to learn how, how can I be productive? How do I keep this calendar? It's like protecting the castle. Um, but productivity by itself has been, you know, this is the magic pill. Americans, we just need to be productive. We just need to be more and more productive. The reality is I had a client, who, mortgage officer, mortgage agent. He started his own business and found this incredible niche, people with 800 plus credit scores, <laughs> right? Novel. Um, 
And once he figured out how he could advertise these people, not only advertise, but he figured out to speed up the process so they were closed in a week. In a week. So you think about it. If you were to create something that would appeal to higher net worth individuals, people that have these um, you know, great credit scores because they did their homework and they figured out and they were ready and they were prepared, and you could give them a service like that in a week, don't you think that everybody who knew those people would be referring to them like crazy? That's what happened. And in August of it was like 2009, he was in Forbes magazine and um, found out they interviewed him. He had 1,500% increase in sales. They closed like, I think it was like $30 million in mortgages. Okay, so I had to help him <laughs> with his productivity. He was working 80 plus hours a week, totally understandable, right? Um, because he wasn't able to offload some of these things. He was doing so much. Well, he's like, Travis, you taught me all these productivity tips. These are phenomenal. Now, what's going to stop me from not working 80 hours still? Well, it's because you need to do steps one, two, three. So this alone, just these steps alone productivity will help you, but it can make you a more productive workaholic if you're not careful. So be careful. So that's, <laughs> that is the caution. Number one, Organization. Number two, processing. If you're not organized, your office is a disaster. Good luck. If you don't know where files are, how you how you have interactions with your with your clients, if you don't have an organized process, you don't know step one through ten through the whole process, and then how you go through the customer service with them. Good luck. You're wasting a whole lot of time. And your employees that are working with you, your team, they're also wasting their time because they're not sure what to do. This needs to be spelled out. Your office needs to be cleaned. What I used to do is go in and spend two days, take everything out of the office, and put it all back in. And we'd organize it with the computer, the cell phone, everything. But um, we've graduated from that process. <laughs> now instead of drinking from a fire hose, we do this over about a six-month period, and it's a lot better. But processing is number two. So first one, get rid of distractions. Minimize what we call contact points or collection points where things pile up. Paperwork. There should be a system. You should know. Um, most of us have about 35 contact points. 35. Okay, it's our cell phones. Like you, any red spot on your cell phone, notification, that's a collection point. Text messages, voicemail, emails. How many email accounts do you have? Well, I have five or six. Yeah, you do. And you probably don't have them all into one. Me, I have six. Six. Because I have six, I work like a machine. I just process through these things every single day. And that's this next part. part. You need to have a step-by-step -step rule to follow in order to process. And you need to do this every day. These steps, I have it in the worksheet. I know we're running um, short on time. So it goes like this. You take your email, your text messages, your voicemail, your physical inbox, your portable inbox, those are the approved collection points, your task list, those are the five or six that I have, and you go through them one by one. And you decide, is this task worth doing? If it's not, throw it away. How much time we waste on that, right? If it's worth doing, great. Can I do it now in five minutes? If I can do it, then get it done now. Don't waste time. Don't decide hum and ha. Do it. If if it takes longer than five minutes, then you have to ask yourself, is this something that is going to take longer than 30 minutes, or does this have a due date? If it has a due date, put it on your calendar. If it takes longer than 30 minutes, put it on your calendar. But if you have your ideal calendar, you'll know where to put this. When I'm like, I need a podcast idea, I throw it to Fridays. I'm like, oh, this is an organization business development thing, it goes to Monday. It's very simple. I drag and drop emails, tasks, all day long in my outlook to where it needs to go. Very, very effective. I could spend hours on this, but this is just the basics. This will help you because then all those other things, you have a task list. And I don't care if that's a million long, but most of those tasks, those are those things that we're like, yeah, we'd really like to get those things done. We spend a lot of time at work doing those tasks as we feel good. Check, 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 right? Fulfillment. I did something today. I was accomplished. The reality is those things aren't higher priority. They're not on your calendar. It's not something you could do right away. Do this an hour a day, five days a week. It will make you so productive. And then you'll be focused because your brain is a constant reminder. 
I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. I got to do that. And when you get reminded by other things that you see or hear, it triggers it. All right, so remember, this step alone is not sufficient. You need steps one through three, but follow your ideal calendar and create processing time. Secret sauce, five minutes to share. Accountability, accountability, accountability. Can't press this one enough. Once you have these skills, it's phenomenal, it's great, but if you want to make anything stick long term, I've studied human change and development for years. And if you want to change, well, it, most of the time these habits that you didn't learn probably started with a member of your family. Um, so it makes a whole lot of sense to have this type of accountability. Coaching, phenomenal. That's what I do. I love it. I love to coach. I love to help. You actually, as financial advisors and planners, you do coaching. Even if you don't know it or agree with it, you do. You coach. You help people along. You help them change behavior. Um, but the top in the industry seldom do this alone. They have coaches. They bring in coaches. Tom Brady has three coaches. Um, we know this in any top tier of, of profession. Now, here's the thing. Having an accountability partner is not only a must, but if you want to survive nowadays, you need to have it. It's in your firm. It's in your family. We can look at how this works. Um, but I discovered in all of my research, I, had a, I have a family relations degree. I didn't do you know, financial planning as my, my PhD. It was family relations. I found that when couples work together, and this is my dissertation, couples work together on their goals, they're going to reach them. When they have shared values, they're going to accomplish their goals. So I made this whole system based around accountability. OK, well, Travis, I'm not married. That's fine. But I do believe, maybe yet, um, that's, that's fine. You have another accountability partner. Ask a friend, a family member, somebody who's close to you to be that accountability partner. But those who are married, the number one person who cares about your time more than you do is them. And they will keep your ideal calendar. And they will help you to not be this overworked person. They want your time. Okay? So I teach how to not just make an accountability partner someone who's cracking the whip, someone who's nitpicky, hey, you didn't come home to, you know, on time today. That's not it. The point is to learn how to coach each other. When couples learn how to coach each other through this process of life, they go from really you know, nice friends and, and companions and mates to fellow coaches. And this is now what I help financial advisors to do so they can achieve their own goals, and then they teach it to their clients. It's beautiful. It works. Um, so business coaches, they're great, but they want to be your coach forever. Therapists, they're not trained on how to teach couples how to be each other's coach. They're trained to diagnose and to treat. This is the secret sauce. If you can keep this calendar based on your values and goals and priorities and do this together, it just works. So with your accountability partner, your spouse, um, or somebody else if, you don't, if you're not married, help, they'll help you keep your ideal calendar, reach your goals. I suggest couple development time once a week where you sit down and go over your goals and values together. Also, go over your money once a week. You look at your budget, look at your financial plan. I used to do this with my clients. I'd get them set up on Monday nights, have them do this. My wife and I have been doing this for 17 years, and it works. It's phenomenal. But if you can get your clients to even do that, they'll start to change their behavior. They'll work at it together and couple time. All right, so if you haven't, definitely grab the, the slides, the bonuses. We couldn't get to everything, obviously, today. There's a lot more here. I'm happy to be a resource. Um, I'm also happy to, to jump on a call, those of you full-time people that want to pick my brain and have a free coaching call. I'd be happy to discuss with you your broken time management system, how we can help that, how we can discover what's going wrong. Um, the goal is really just to help you discover what's limiting you, what's causing you some psychological barriers there. Um, so text me, and I'm happy to, to chat with you about that. At the end, really quick recap. Financial advisors, we need this work-life balance. Uh, keep your ideal calendar. Your values are your keys to your direction. Values-based goals, this is your action. Priorities, so much needed in today's world in order for you to be productive and stay accountable. Um, thanks for your time today. You guys are a great audience. This is my legacy. This is my purpose. Thanks for being here today.